Hello guys, Winston here. When one of my friends asked about commissioning a desk piece for her aviation-loving partner and engineer, I knew I had to take a shot at it. I know firsthand how strange the minds of engineers can be, and there were a couple ideas and motifs my friend had laid out that I thought would make for a fun if not quirky project. First off, the recipient had an affinity for hexagons, who could fault him? They are the most complex regular polygon that can tile a plane perfectly and infinitely, and they look dang good doing so. Anytime you want to make a modular board game, bam, hexagons. Want something to look futuristic? Bam, hexagons. Got a structural component that needs to look cool? You get the point. Hexagons are the bestagons. Secondly, as an engineer, the recipient really enjoyed what was lovingly described as big stupid aluminum. Usually, most people value qualities inherent to an object like practicality and elegance, but sometimes you come across a solution that's so brutally minimal, direct, and most importantly, chunky, that you can't help but admire it. So the more unnecessary aluminum I could use in my design, the better. These were the guidelines I had for designing and producing a box. My friend even gave me a rough sketch to go off of. And this is what a good client does. Open-ended design problems can be really annoying to figure out. This is especially true for me because I don't consider my imagination to be very good. But if you provide some reasonable constraints that bound the problem, I will be a lot less miserable. Establishing size and form factor up front went a long way towards making me a lot more comfortable with this project. Now, I would have loved to slap a 20 pound brick of aluminum onto a UMC 750 and go wild, but it just wasn't practical or cost effective, nor was I qualified to borrow the UMC at work. I figured using a thick aluminum plate as part of the box would be the next best thing, but trying to make a solid aluminum box would have been a bridge too far for my capabilities. So I had to go back and look at this from a woodworking perspective and think about the ways that you can make a box from flat materials. Based on my experience prototyping a wooden PC enclosure for artesian builds, the idea of a continuous grain wrap really stuck with me. If I could machine segments with properly beveled sides, I could roll them up into the walls of a hexagonal box. A 60 degree V-bit would be perfect for this. The problem with a continuous grain wrap on a box, however, is that there will inevitably be a point where the neighboring panels don't quite line up. On things like a waterfall table or a bench, this isn't a problem, but on a box that begs to be examined from every side, I couldn't bear to have a non-matching seam. So this is where my brainstorming process led me to the idea of combining wooden panels with epoxy. That would allow me to add an accent detail and some extra style, and distract people from the fact that the grain wouldn't wrap 360 degrees around the box. At the same time though, I really wasn't happy with the amount of aluminum I was able to cram into this project. I had modeled in a 3 8 inch thick plate as the base for this box to add some heft, but visually there really wasn't all that much aluminum to admire without picking the box up and flipping it over. Recalling that the recipient of this box was an aviation lover, the solution I came up with was to combine aluminum honeycomb with epoxy. In addition to looking cool, the aluminum honeycomb would be a nice callback to the aerospace world since that material is used a lot in the industry along with composites. I modeled up a hexagonal box with a slanted interface between the wood and epoxy sections to make that transition point a little more interesting. Once I had everything modeled up, I ordered a sheet of aluminum honeycomb on eBay and prepared to embed it in epoxy. And many mistakes were made during this process, which I think make great teaching points, so I'll highlight them as they come up. The first step in this process was to cut my honeycomb down into manageable sized pieces. The easiest way to cut honeycomb without completely mangling the sheet is to use a bandsaw. I kept the honeycomb sandwiched in the cardboard that it shipped in for a little extra support and protection, but by and large, this was as easy as it looked in the other YouTube videos where I learned this trick. Next, I made a basic form to contain my honeycomb and epoxy. I really don't recommend particle board and hot glue for making your mold, but it worked passably well in my case. If I could do it again, I would make sure the bottom piece was of a much sturdier material, because as epoxy cures, it shrinks, and if your mold isn't rigid enough, your cast piece will end up cupping slightly. But that's not even the biggest problem here. My symphony of fails really began in earnest when I added the epoxy. Total boat thick set is rated for a half inch pour, and usage up to around 80 degrees Fahrenheit, though you can go thicker in small pours. I was right at the upper limits of those specifications. My honeycomb was half an inch thick, and I poured a millimeter or two above that to fully submerge it, and I was pouring during the day where the temperature was in the mid to upper 70s. 
These two factors push the epoxy into exothermic territory, where the heat released during curing causes the epoxy to cure faster, releasing even more heat, and it was really just a nasty positive feedback loop. Luckily, my hot glue job held up so I didn't lose containment on my mold, but I got a lot of big bubbles in the middle of my pour. I let that set up overnight and tried to salvage what I could. I put the slab of epoxy on the Shapeoko and machined the bubbly warped faces. It revealed a lot of voids in the casting, but also highlighted an adhesion issue. Epoxy contracts as it cures. This is exacerbated with thermal gradients. So the tall silos of epoxy segregated by the honeycomb pulled away from the walls as they set. They were held in place by the skin of the epoxy on the outer surfaces, but once those were machined away, I had a bunch of little hexagonal beads of epoxy falling out of the slab. There was no saving this stock, so I went back to my garage to apply the lessons learned. This time, before I even reached for the epoxy, I lightly sandblasted my honeycomb to promote mechanical adhesion with the epoxy. This was a painfully slow process with my little Harbor Freight air eraser, but it would be a piece of cake with a proper sandblasting cabinet. That's something I would definitely invest in if I had the space. I also started my epoxy pour earlier in the morning and did it in two phases to avoid going exothermic again. This would give me a chance to fill any gaps in the honeycomb if the resin started pulling away from the walls and also resulted in a flatter end product since the stress gradient through the slab was less pronounced. One interesting phenomenon that resulted was a slightly sunken honeycomb texture that appeared on the surface as the epoxy contracted and set. It was cool enough that I wanted to preserve this in the final piece, though that would prove to be a logistical nightmare. With my wood and epoxy stock ready to go, it was time to machine my side panels. First, I cut out the wood panels. This was the same strategy as with my Avium PC enclosure panels. Use roughing tool paths to get me to near net shape, clean up the horizontal and vertical faces with the appropriate tool paths, and then use the perfect angle V-bit to bevel the ends. In this case, 60 degrees. The epoxy panels were pretty much the same deal, except I used much more conservative speeds and feeds to put as little stress on the material as possible. Up until this point, I wasn't sure just how good the adhesion of the epoxy with the aluminum honeycomb was. I knew it would be better than before, I just didn't know if it would hold up. Other than the tiniest bit of chipping where a tiny pocket of epoxy was isolated by the honeycomb near the edge of a panel, everything turned out shockingly well. Machining was the first challenge though, the next one was assembly. Because of the wildly disparate materials and elements going into this box, I had to choose my adhesives and their applications carefully. For epoxy to epoxy and epoxy to wood interfaces, the obvious choice was more epoxy, and I made sure to scuff up the mating faces first with coarse grit sandpaper. For the wood to wood interfaces, I would of course use wood glue. Individually, these operations to stick pieces together wouldn't be a big deal, but one factor I kept a very close eye on was squeeze out. Not only would cleaning up glue and epoxy squeeze out be super annoying on the inside of a finished box, but it would also affect the absorption of any wipe on finish on the wood and risk blemishing the natural as cast surface of the epoxy. I wouldn't really be able to come back with sandpaper to remove surface imperfections because that would remove that wavy texture that I was trying to keep. So I worked slowly with a lot of masking tape at my seam lines and was quick to wipe up any squeeze out. Also, because of the construction of this box with the bottom being held in a groove, the aluminum plate I was using as the base of the box had to be installed at the time of the final glue up. In hindsight, I probably could have blocked in the base plate later, but at the time, I wanted the box to be made of as few separate pieces as possible. I knew my tolerances would probably be on the negative side for the wood and epoxy pieces, so I deliberately undersized the aluminum hexagon base by about half a millimeter. This would make things easier to assemble and guarantee that I wouldn't have any issues gluing the halves of the box together. The last step was to make a lid, and for that I used a maple board of sufficient width and v-carved a pair of frigates to do an epoxy inlay per the client's request. This was a two-sided process with the bottom machined first because the alignment of the magnets was critical, but the inlay was not. I used the Shapeoko to deck off excess epoxy and sanded the machining marks away with a random orbit sander. To finish the wood and epoxy, I figured the safest finish would be one made by the manufacturer of the epoxy, and that was Total Boat Halcyon. I applied a few coats with the aluminum plate masked off as best I could. Now, you're supposed to thoroughly rough up epoxy before applying any sort of finish over it for adhesion purposes, but I couldn't bring myself to do much more than a very light scuffing with 320 grit for fear of losing the macro texture of that honeycomb pattern. Luckily, that was enough for the varnish to stick to the box without flaking off. 
The result at this point was nearly as cool as I expected, though I wish I had made the epoxy a tad more opaque. Still, getting this far was very exciting for me. Being so close to the finish line though, this last step was the most terrifying. I had to machine a triangular hole pattern to match up with the magnets in the lid. This could not have been done before the final glue up because if I drilled magnet holes in the side panels before fitting them together, I wouldn't know the exact radius and they wouldn't match the lid perfectly. I cut out a plastic template to help me align my box to my shape oko and set my zero. That template with a hole in the middle allows me to line up the box to my spindle and call that my X and Y origin point. The only thing that I had to really carefully eyeball was to make sure that the box wasn't crooked. I held down my hexagonal box with double-sided tape, though I probably should have blocked it in with some clamps. But using some very conservative speeds and feeds, I machined the magnet pockets successfully. And now I could finally breathe a sigh of relief because this thing was ready to ship. Conceptually, this was a pretty straightforward project. But getting to the final design was an exercise in creativity and client communication. Getting to the finished product was a nerve-wracking series of steps where I had to trust in my understanding and execution of basic maker skills and woodworking techniques. Is this piece flawless? For the sake of my client's recipient, I should probably say yes, but the reality of most of the things we do is that there will always be small imperfections here and there, and in this case, I think the end result is still a sincere expression of the process and thought that went into it, and a darn cool desk piece. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back eventually with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.